Hi guys, welcome. This is great to have you here on this webinar. We've got, I think we thought it was about 238 people registered for the webinar, which is kind of cool. And we'll probably have about, I'm gonna guess about 85, 100 of you all show up. So that's kind of nice. So thank you for joining us. Rachel, Deb, Leisha, Dawn, Amber, Leah, Lori, Debbie, Barbara, Natalie, Margaret. Oh my God, I could just keep going. Joanne, Jacqueline, Nicole, Lorraine, la la la. Somebody, somebody just calls themselves owner. I love this. I think they just like, you know, own the fitness world, which is fantastic. So what I would like you to do is this webinar is about down and dirty cheap tricks for trainers. Don't let the title fool you. They, and all these guys were talking about before we turned the camera on was expensive rubber. That's really nice of all of you up there. Um, this webinar discusses the science behind the most common and most un underused exercises and how simple modifications can dramatically affect your client's results. And we're going to look at cheap tricks to motivate your clients to get them fast and safe results. So what I'd like you guys to do is move your mouse. I think you all know what to do. Go to the bottom of, of your screen. You're gonna go to the left of the green share button, click on the chat box and you've already started. I love this, Jackie. You're from Sacramento, California. You guys put where you're from, Jackie from Alabama, Cleveland, Ohio, someone from Michigan, another one from California. We've got people from New Jersey, from Jackson, Wyoming, love it, Wisconsin, Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. All right, so type in where you're from. I want you to know where the chat box is because these people will answer your questions. That's a benefit of showing up and, and being on a webinar. Also, it forces you to pay attention. I know I try to listen to recordings, but I never give it the attention it deserves. We're gonna look at um, all these different ways that we can get fast and safe workouts. One of my favorite people in the world is Abby Apple. For one thing, I love her clothes. So you, you've got to compliment her on that with all her fruffy sleeves. She's the owner and CEO of Abby Fit Consulting. She is the um, faculty director of our bar certification and the SCW Pilates certification. She's an award-winning fitness educator, and she develops and delivers programs for multiple companies such as Schwinn, Power Systems, and others. We've got Giovanni Roselli, and were those really your abs in Kevin's background? <laughs> no one understands what you're asking me right now. I don't care. Yes, they, I can yes, pull it back up. Yes, they were. We may have you do that. I can't go there right now. But Giovanni Roselli recently was voted SCW's 2020 Livestream Mania Best Male Presenter. He's a highly sought after personal trainer and group fitness instructor. He's a master instructor for both the Institute of Motion and Viper Pro. He also leads the SCW Kettlebell Certification and Corrective Exercise Certification. He's been a professional actor as well as, weren't you one of the competitors, Gio? competitors and Sarah you are on top of your game today uh I think <laughs> maybe you're referring to professional wrestling that I professional that I used to in wrestling day. he's can't you tell by the shirt it's just it, it's a tell-all <laughs> it's, it's a tell-all this guy knows his stuff okay as he always says he's been injured by everybody and he's injured everything so he really looks at corrective exercise. He's a top personal trainer out of Florida. We've got Kevin Mullins with us is one of my newest favorite. Yeah, there you go. Um, one of our newest favorite educators. He wrote our, our very new functional training certification, which is getting really great reviews. He's a fitness professional, an educator, an author. He's coached over 20,000 personal training sessions in the last decade. He's an author of the best-selling personal training book, Day by Day, Personal Trainer's Blueprint. Um, this guy knows his stuff. We've got David Betcher. He's a newer presenter with us, also knows his stuff. He is the workshop manager and a lecturer 
for the Brooke Bush Institute. He's a professor of kinesiology and the director of education for the National Personal Training Institute, NPTI. So we've got like a cast, a cast of thousands. We've got a really incredibly well-educated class uh, of presenters. And well, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna start with what are some of the most underutilized exercises that work multiple muscle groups simultaneously. I'm gonna start with you, David, because we started chatting about making sure that you pick an exercise that's challenging, but then you can make it creative as well. Yeah, I think one of the things that gets underutilized um, is combining some things. So if you're, if you're short on time or your session's limited, if you're doing 30 minute sessions, um, doing things like lunges and curls or step up and presses or squat and presses and things where you can use uh, things that you can do multiple uh, movements with tend to be kind of an easier underutilized exercise um, that kind of hit a lot of different muscle groups all in one shot. So I certainly utilize that for the people that I work with um, in that kind of shortened time frame or uh, even in a virtual setting. Uh, I think that works really well. Yeah, and we were chatting about this that um, by using multiple muscle groups at the same, you know, simultaneously, <clears throat> you can train your client also faster, which maximizes their time and maximizes your time and your wallet. Because if you're if you're training someone at eighty dollars an hour, and you can charge somebody instead of eighty, you're going to charge two different people fifty. You know, we we all have a lot of us at least have kids, and we've got to put food on the table. We've got to pay our rent. Everybody, yeah. Everybody's like, I don't think so. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Kevin. Yeah, nothing right. knows of. Kevin yeah, doesn't have any kids that he knows of. <laughs> um, I thought that was your line, Abby. So <laughs> we've got, but it, it maximizes our time and it's a great, you know, it's a great way to get um, uh, the exercises in. All right, Kevin, stop laughing. So what would you do? What are some of the most utilized, underutilized exercises that work multiple muscle groups? I'm a big fan of anything that gets the hips involved, especially if you can load it up and then pairing it. So I'm cheating a little bit, but like an immediate pairing. So like a swing, a kettlebell swing directly into a short set of push-ups, and you emphasize both. So it's not so much one exercise, but you truly don't rest between them. It's sit the bell down and move directly into it. That way you can keep intensity high on, on both movements because to, to David's point, that is one of the best ways to optimize time. But if I have a client who can lunge 40 pound dumbbells, but can only press 15s or 20s, the lunge won't be that hard. But if I say, all right, give me eight lunges per leg back to back, and now immediately sit those down and grab these other bells, give me eight straight push presses. Now you may rest. It's sort of like one exercise to sort of compound it. Um, so that's my favorite thing to do. But I want the hips involved in almost any movement um period yeah and that's because of caloric mm -hmm. expenditure it's a larger group larger muscle group and i've never met a single human in my life that says i wish i had a less attractive butt <laughs> i've never met anyone i mean if they're out there i've <laughs> never met them so everyone i i swear i think 2021 is the year of the butt you know i i think 2020 was the year of like nothing, but 2019 was all about the core. Yeah. And I think now we're going, you know, and I'm taking core. I hate to say this, sadly, I think people think of abs, but I do think it's a year of the butt. Gio, what do you recommend if you're trying to get to maximize someone's work? Yeah. And I totally agree uh, with, with David and Kevin. Those obviously would have been some of my answers too. So what I'll try to do is add something and and give a little different perspective. So I, I would say my suggestion would be to maximize our planes of motion. And I'm a big 3D guy, multi-planar type of guy. So, you know, if you're looking to do, you know, uh, freshen up some squats, or if you're looking to, you know, have caloric expenditure, then maybe do a sagittal plane squat and then do a frontal plane squat and then do a transverse plane squat and then 
kind of combine those. And then before you know it, you're doing, you know, three different movements versus staying in the same spot. That's probably going to elicit some type of cardio uh, respiratory response. And, you know, same thing with uh, 3D arm drivers. So instead of keeping your arms in one place, maybe you're, you know, you're lunging and you have light dumbbells in your hand and maybe you lunge, you know, you do a side raise and then you do a lunge and you do a front raise and then you do, uh, uh, you know, a bent over, uh, you know, rear delt fly and then you go back to the lunge. So, you know, maybe <laughs> combining more, you know, planes of motion and thinking about, you know, how can I get in the frontal plane and transverse plane, which I think we would all agree that are underutilized just in general. So why not put something in there that involves more, more of what we already need anyway? And Abby, do you, you know, when we look at this, we think, okay, what are we going to do with men? What are we going to do with women? Do you think it, it it's different? Do you think there's a different focus here? If we're going to try to, like Kevin said, integrate two different exercises together, or like David said, let's combine in one exercise, two different muscle groups. Do we address it differently for a man and a woman? No, I mean, yeah, they're, they're the same muscles. They're the same muscles. I mean, we have different hormones but it's the same muscle. I mean, I, 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 quick, I crack up because we, I've done, you know, we did a glute, a glute webinar last week, but I would have loved to have talked about how, you know, the research shows that the glute muscle on a man and a woman is the same, it's the same muscle. And it's just amazing how differently women train their glutes and men train their glutes. And we're like, okay, these are girl exercises and these are, you know, guy exercises. And I've heard that, you know, how, you know things like kneeling donkey kicks things like that. How often do you see a guy doing those exercises? So women tend to, they want to stay away from doing some of the heavier strength training movements. Some of the more Olympic lifting things they try to stay away from, which really they shouldn't be doing. They should be actually moving toward those. And of course that means, you know, learning the technique a little bit slower, but all those things. And I know um, Kevin was talking about that adding, I, I don't know if you mentioned it, you said, cause you said adding like swings to your deadlifts, adding a little bit of power and reactive movement, all of that stuff, both men, and women need. And I'm going to just make, I'm going to, I'm going to little departure from everybody else. Cause you what Gio said just a moment ago about the, the planes of motion. I was like, yes, but also there's one exercise that I absolutely love that I do. I mean, I do with almost all of my classes. And of course I, you know, with, with of course recovery days, but the bent over single arm row, I know I'm like, okay, it's one exercise, but man, if I could pick one exercise that I was going to do all the time, like at least once a week, it would be the bent over single arm row because it requires stability in your spine, your pelvis, your abdominals. I think the research shows that your abdominals actually work harder doing during that movement. When you're parallel with the ground, single arm movement, because your body's reacting to the asymmetrical load, your abs work harder in that exercise than doing a crunch, than doing a plank. So things like that, where it's unsupported, your back has to work, your glutes have to work to stabilize the area. And then you've got, you, you can't even help it. Even if you were to square yourself, you always add a little bit of rotation, especially when you're doing anything that's, that's unilateral. So that's great. And Kevin, you're smiling and you're covering your mouth. So go for it. Just say it. He was talking nerdy and I liked every bit of it. Uh, I just, <laughs> me, I'm like booty. Look, no, booty just class. like the asymmetrical load. And I think one of the muscles, a lot of people, you want to talk about guys and girls, the most undertrained muscle in men across the globe, the adductors. Yes, fellas, you have muscles in your inner thighs and they need to do things. And if you can't squat or deadlift heavier, check in with those bad boys, the Sartorius, Gracilis, like Opterus Longus, Magnus, Brevis. I can go on and make, make nerdy words, but I, Abby nailed that. That's actually a great exercise. So I sat here and I was like, that's, actually, that's, that's a really good answer. <laughs> it is. You, you know, you just... You think Abby just stands at a bar and looks pretty. Okay, she does stand at a bar. Thank you for that. Yeah, but, I don't yeah. look pretty, but I stand at a yeah, bar. Yeah, yeah. But no, she, she, she knows her stuff. It's great stuff. Um, and when we're conducting virtual sessions, because we, a lot of us are stuck with virtual, and I'm going to tell you, I keep reading a lot of articles that are going on right now, and they're talking about, yes, vertical, the, uh, the virtual sessions are going to continue and virtual training is going to continue and education although we know we want you know we want students college students um elementary students to go back into the classroom there's going to be a somewhat of a retention on the virtual training which is great 
So when you're conducting a virtual training session, what movements um, can we recommend clients to do if they have limited access to equipment? David, I'm going to go back to you because you had, I, I thought you had a really creative idea on that. Uh, thanks, I guess. Um, so one of the things that I, I do with virtual uh, sessions and in-person sessions is modifying tempo. I think that's an underutilized technique or tool in our toolbox where you can still do a, a row, a chest press, a hip hinge, a deadlift, a squat, whatever, even if you have a fairly light or limited selection of equipment at home or only have a couple dumbbells or a kettlebell that you found on sale from somewhere. Um, but if you change the tempo, right, focus more on like a longer eccentric or a longer concentric or even an isometric hold at different portions of that exercise, um, you can really make that challenging and maintain that intensity, even though you might be limited with the weight that you're using or, or the equipment that you're using. So the tempo usage, I think, is really great. And Abby, I'm going to jump back at you. You talked about the uni uh, unilateral movement, which I think you can perform the same movement. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple of things there. So if you are limited with equipment, I mean, the two pieces of equipment that you probably need in your house of course, are dumbbells, and you need elastic resistance, something to do that you can pull, you know, again, and then you can combine the, the, um, the pieces of equipment together, which I do, um, I do that a lot. So I, what was your question again? Not sure I, was just, I was just thinking about that. Say it one more time. Okay, well, it's like, all right, you're virtually training your clients. Yes. And you're staring at them. And you're like, okay, you know, go pick up your kettle weight. Well, right. sweetheart, I don't have a kettle weight. Right. Oh, I, I have a water bottle. Maybe I have a, uh, a I can take a, a big container of Tide. I just went grocery right. shopping and, you know, they're heavy. Well, you have to know what they have. I mean, of course, I think that's important because I use, you know, for gliders, I use paper plates and hand towels and things like that, whatever you have in the house. And we've been doing that for, gosh, with SEW for the past year when we're doing our workshops. But I also think that you have to have a really strong understanding of different intensity variables how to make movements easier and harder. And I know you just mentioned it, I think Dave, when you said tempo, I honestly, I think people don't understand that tempo is different than just speed. People think speed and tempo are the exact same thing. So think about speed is just moving faster, but if you add tempo, it means you're changing, you're changing the speed of either the concentric or the eccentric portion of the movement. So that's another way, but going back to what you said about unilateral, I mean, it could be unilateral moving from a bilateral movement, you know, doing a bilateral squat to a unilateral squat, but it could also be just changing your lever length. So body position, changing your lever length, making, making things more challenging that way. Um, so I think range of motion. So if people really understand all of the different ways that you can increase the intensity without adding extra load, because you know you are limited with what you have in the house, you um, give yourself just a lot more tools when you know that. Plane of motion, another one. Yeah, I think that's really good. I also wonder that, you know, I think about uh, training people at home. I I teach a yoga, a virtual yoga class, and I've literally asked my 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 students, you know, turn your computer around, turn your iPad around. I want to see where you're working out, how you're working out, and they show me what they've got in their house. And you can actually email them a list of potential equipment, like um. Uh, one of my personal training clients didn't have any bands. Well, hello, SCW sells bands. I'm thinking, I'll just mail her a set of bands. But in the meantime, take an old pair of tights, you know, tie the ends together and you've got a round loop band and it's pretty, it's flexible enough. Okay. Pantyhose. A pantyhose. Oh my God. Does anyone <laughs> have pantyhose no. anymore? And does anybody actually wear shoes? I don't think I've put on a skirt in, in uh, 11 months. More All right, Florida. but Gio, you, you're lucky enough to be able to work with a lot of people outside. Mm -hmm. Okay, it, you know, and how do you vary up? Do you do a lot of virtual training or are you trying to really get people to work with you safely outside, at least during COVID? Yeah, well, a little bit of both. And I'll just, you know, definitely agree with with the comments before I feel like, yeah, what, what they said. Um, and then I'll just try to add something on. But uh, to to Abby's point with the levers, um, 
if I take a small weight, could be 10 pounds, I am much stronger with that 10 pounds within my body and within that mid within my midline. I can make the exercise more challenging. I can make it harder if I move the weight where away from my midline because we are much weaker just based off of our, our lever, based off our connective tissue when a weight is moving away from our body. So sometimes I'll try to look at, well, if you only have 10 pounds, if you're gonna you know, hold it here versus hold it here, it's gonna be a lot harder just to hold that 10 pounds out here. So I'm essentially, I'm making the exercise harder just by where, you know, where, we're, putting, uh, where we're putting our levers and where we're, where we're moving our, our hands and, and our feet to kind of piggyback off what Abby said. Oh, this is great. So like, um, it, it's fantastic if we can change the speed of a movement. Um, if we can change the pattern of a movement, if we can change where we're holding whatever piece of resistance, whether it is a hand weight, you know, a, 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 a container of Tide, you know, pantyhose, Abby. Um, I think that that's great. And that provides us variety if we are virtually training. Um, Kevin, what have you seen happen with some of the equipment people are trying to use virtually? Have they been creative? Is it, has it been safe? Do you think it's created a, a, you know, more of a community feel with people or a closer relationship somehow than maybe getting them to come to a gym using their equipment, you get them to have to be creative within their own home? Um, one, uh, safety is at times questionable. Um, I personally haven't had anything happen in any of my sessions, but I have seen and heard of uh, quite a few fails wrapping bands over things that aren't exactly solid. And so hello band to face, or uh, I heard a story, a guy tried to deadlift his stove and ended up rolling the stove out of his Manhattan apartment window. And it fell like a solid 30 floors. Like when he went to lift it and like really get some energy to it, it just kept going. Look at Sarah's face. Oh my God. So I've, I've, I've heard some things. So, um, you know, that's something one of my kids would do. I'm not kidding. One of my, <laughs> one of my four hoodlums that I've raised. I, I, I feel like if it happened to me, there would be no limit to the amount of four letter words that come out of my mouth. Um, Waiver. But, but to the point, um, I don't, Think. I don't want to be the negative Nancy here. I don't think there's a community that forms virtually. I think early on, there was this sort of, we're all in this together, but I do believe Zoom fatigue is a little bit more real. And I've experienced it firsthand being in a fitness, fitness facility. People are stoked to be back. By and large, more and more people, especially as vaccination reaches a higher level, um, people are getting back in and they're like, oh yeah, I liked this before. I think sometimes if we look at human psychology, and I know this has nothing to do with training directly, but we look at human psychology, sometimes we have to convince ourselves of things to preserve our own happiness and our mental state. So I think a lot of people, when you pulled them in August, while things were still really bad, are you ever going to go back to a gym again? No, I've got everything I need at home. Why use a perfectly normal dumbbell when I could just lift my children and my detergent? Yes, people, people want to go back. I'm... I'm proud of human ingenuity, of figuring out things. I know my wife and I, we, uh, we don't have water on the fridge and that drives me nuts, but I did use my business account to get like ready refresh, like the big five gallon things like you find in an office. So early on, we didn't have any weights at all. So I was like, all right, these things are like a solid 30 or 40 pounds. So we at least had a little something. Uh, so we were being, being creative too, but I, I, I have to say not to be the negative one. I don't think a community has formed on Facebook of like tied detergent lifters unite <laughs> stove flipper outer window people <laughs> assemble. <laughs> but I, th I think, all right, well here, I love this. Diana wrote, if my clients have light dumbbells and bands, I will have them pair them together to make it harder and slow the tempo. Hearing things as creative. Yeah. Well, that's all. That's awesome too, because it also manipulates the force, or I actually, I'm sorry, the resistance profile. So at the bottom, the dumbbells weigh basically nothing. Let's take a biceps curl, right? So the the, the dumbbell weighs nothing really at the bottom or at the very top, but at the very top where you want to feel that the most, that band really picks up. So they might only be holding a 10 pound 
dumbbell and let's call it a 12 pound band. So they're getting 22 and a half plus at the top, but at the bottom where the joint's a little bit more susceptible, uh, they're, they're actually quite safe. Yes. It, she just said it joint friendly. That's really nice. And Morgan said, <laughs> she brought this up, <clears throat> dumbbells crashing into ceiling fans life and, and life last year, there were a lot of failing, you know, what the fitness video fail videos. I love those. I mean, I don't really love those. If you look at around my house, if you go into my basement, I've got like the ceiling is covered with, with ball, like, um, black little rings all over the place because the boys are playing you know baseball in there I remember once I came home in the house and we have a rule there's no ball playing upstairs you can play it in the basement I come in the house and they all meet me at the door and I'm like what happened I look over at the window there's a hole in the window just like this they were playing frisbee is it but mom it's not a ball I'm like all right and I pulled the old wait till your father gets home and I had to go to the bedroom laughing hysterically. Um, anyway, how can we quickly and easily teach proper form for both in-person and virtual clients? Like, how do you make that happen when you're training virtual clients, Kevin? I think one of the things you want to do is establish the big rocks, right? So what are the things that if a client does them wrong, bad things could actually happen. Start there and master those. So let's just say something like a Romanian deadlift or any type of hip hinge where we know the lower back is already in a position. So, you know, using short external cues, a little less, I need you to squeeze your adductus and your t rexosaurus and a little bit more. I want you to imagine you're shutting a car door with your butt and your hands are full of groceries. I want you to tuck your belt buckle into your butt. I want you, you know, whatever cues you use that creates this visual. And then once you have that, especially when you're doing virtually, it's about, okay, what is the thing that will optimize this the most and leave it at that, knowing that there's a little bit of gray area virtually that you're probably not going to perfect a movement. Now in person, you've got all these different sessions. You can do the 360 walk around and this, that, and the other. But I would just say the most important thing is like, what is the thing in the movement you're doing that poses the biggest risk? Start there and only focus there um, until that's to a point where you're like, all right, we're good. We can execute this at a higher level. Um, David, what do you think about something you can quickly and easily teach um, to emphasize proper form and alignment, both virtually or distinctly from virtually from in person? Is it that different? Yeah, virtual is definitely tough. Um, you know, you have your clients, um, you know, you have a couple different types of learners. And we all remember this from school, the, the audio learners, the, the kinesthetic learners and kind of the visual learners. So I think as, as coaches or as trainers, we might have to do, we might have to use all three of those um, kind of cueing techniques for somebody in a virtual format, right? We may actually have to do that exercise with them um, so that they can kind of see us as we're given those great coaching cues that Kevin said, like, don't get all, don't use the technical jargon, simplify, right? Shut the car door with your butt, right? Things, things like that are, are phenomenal. Pretend you're putting on a tight pair of pants, trying to you know, focus on some of that transverse abdominus activation. But you don't have to tell them all those things. You just get, give them those easy cues that they can kind of wrap their head around um, as they see you do it and as you explain what you're doing. That's great. That, that really helps. Um, Geo, do you train people differently, do you think, when you're dealing with them virtually as to when you're training them you know, in a gym, because I know Florida is pretty open right now. Um, are you going into the gym? Are you finding people um, want to go into the gym or are they comfortable staying virtual? And it's like, this is convenient. I just want to, you know, this is the way I want to do it. I think the one, the one thing I could probably summarize, which once again, uh, they did a great job of was get really good at your internal queuing and your external queuing. And the more of that you have in your toolbox, whether you're in person or whether you're in front of a computer, 
And if you can say, you know, uh, hey, hey, Abby, I want you to turn. I want you to make sure your eyes look at that. What is that city landscape? Whatever is the pictures behind you? You know, whatever. Chicago, it is. 1920. Chicago, 1920. Um, you know, and the more <laughs> and the more ways you can do that. And you know, Nick Winkleman is is a really good person to, to go to for cues, where it's internal cue, external cue, and 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 analogy. I almost didn't say that right. Analogy. Um, so, and you, you were actually given, everyone was actually given all these examples from David and Kevin just off the cuff. So the one thing I would say is just, you, you know, the better you are at, at, at your cueing, uh, the, the easier, the easier it's going to be, which maybe just come with repetition. Maybe it's just going to come with practice. Uh, give me a little prediction. I mean, we've got people from all over the country here um, and, and world. There's some people from Canada. Um, give me some prediction on do you think everybody's going to go back to the gym? I mean, Kevin obviously brought up the fact that, yeah, people are just going to be happy to get the heck out of their house, get back into the gym, get away from their children <laughs> or the water bottle, whichever comes first, right? So do you, what do you think? What, I mean, have you seen a big trend? Are the, are the gyms beginning to fill? Me personally, I'm, I'm actually starting to see people, especially the ones that are, have been vaccinated, they're, they're ready to, to go out and start and start doing stuff again. And they're feeling, they're feeling fairly confident. I had, so personally, I had one client uh, over 70. He's like, Gio, I just want you to come over to my house. I'm going to trust you that you're safe. I'm safe. You're going to train at my house. He bought a bike. He bought this. He bought a bench. He bought that. He got vaccinated a couple months ago. And guess what he told me? Hey, uh, I think uh, I'm going to go back to the gym, you know, just to ride the bike and stuff. And, just, you know, and, and that's actually been a story that I've heard quite a bit. I think me personally, I think we're going to start to see everyone uh, start, start creeping back uh, to the gyms. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, I actually go in tomorrow to get knee surgery. I, I'm an idiot. I, I went skiing for a whole month, black diamond skier, not a problem not a problem, crushing my children, my 20 year olds, right? I go, I play pickleball and like an idiot in running shoes and I twist my knee. And so I've gone going in for a knee surgery tomorrow. I can't remember where I started this, but I think I'm back, I'm vaccinated right now. So I got my first one. I just got my second one last week. I'm out there and I'm like, I'm trying to do to walk because that's basically almost the only thing I can do right now, at least limited with my knee. And I'm outside and I, I'm not supposed to be, I'm supposed to be, I don't know, staying away from everyone because I have to go in for surgery and I, I you know, make sure I don't get COVID, but I'm vaccinated and I feel this incredible sense of freedom. Now it, it's not going to be fully kicked in for another two weeks because I just got my second shot last week. But I mean, I'm keeping my mask on, but with all my heart, all I want to do is take my mask off. So I can hear what you're saying, you know, Gio, that people are wanting to go back. Abby, you're also in Florida. Do you see that happening? Do you well, see clients want, you know, yes, I love your virtual classes. I know you teach classes online, but are they wanting to come and take you live? Well, I think the, the clubs now, it wasn't an option before to do both live and virtual. Um, for most people, you either had, you know, your Peloton, as an example, you had your Peloton membership and that was it. Am I still there? Yeah. Yeah. So you, had your Pel you had your Peloton membership. And that was it. Or you had your, you know, your traditional club membership and that was it. So most people don't have multiple memberships. Well, now they're going to have the option of coming to the club live, taking classes, and then maybe when it's convenient for them, staying at home and taking the same class. So it is not going away. And I said this a few times that um, instructors, and I was, I've, I've been writing, long story, I've been writing a book with, we'll talk about when it comes out, but anyway. Um, about virtual training. And I'm telling you right now, the, the instructors and the trainers that really um, will have the best time, they're just the, will be the, really do the best, do the, the best after COVID are the ones who are the hybrid. They're the hybrid, they can do a little bit of both. And what I wanted to mention about that, just to piggyback on everything you guys said, is I think um, what's gonna be really important when you do virtual, it's important live, but it's more important virtual that your verbal cueing is on point because I hear so many people using 
words that have no meaning. And I'm not, when I, when I say like things like move it, it was great saying move it and lift it and bend it when you were live and you had a lot of visual cueing, but now you're on this little tiny screen, they're watching you through their telephone and you're saying move it. And they're like, move what? Bend it, what's it? I always say this all the time, get out of this, this habit of saying the word it, you still hear it in videos. And I'm like, not good videos. So actually say what it is. What is it? Bend your elbow, pull your hand towards your shoulder, whatever you've got to say so people understand what you're talking about, but make your words have more meaning. And then slow down too, which I am always horrible about that. So enunciate and slow down because it's just harder to understand you virtually. And people are having a hard time with hybrid. They really yeah. are. Hybrid yeah. training. And I can't, I think, um, I think it was Lisa commented on it. Hi, a hybrid is very difficult. Um, and the reason it's so difficult is because you're focusing on people you know, in the room and possibly even making comments on them. And it's not like you can turn the camera and have the camera go on them so you see what you're talking about. And then you've also got to focus on people that are on the camera. Um, one of the difficulties that we have, one of the difficulties that we have at the, um, the YMCA I, I teach at is we don't want to put the camera right in the front of us if, if I'm teaching a small group training program because then the people in the room can't see me because it's covering it up. So I put the camera to the side, but then the speakers are facing me. Well, if the music is facing me, I want it facing my, my clients. So we've had to adjust our equipment as well and, and make it so that people can hear us and people can see us. Um, this is, I'm getting a little bit back to the training, high reps or heavy weights which is best and why? Kevin, I'm gonna start with you. Both. <laughs> um, there is- Yes, I knew you were gonna say that. Okay, go ahead. Both, um, <laughs> it's, it's client and goal dependent. It's also where in the workout dependent. If you're starting your workout with your high reps and you're ending with your, your heavy work, you're probably not gonna like your results or at least in terms of the numbers you can move. but. Um, if you're not, and I've said this actually in my certification repeatedly when I teach it, and I think I said it on the last call I did the group, is I'm amazed at how many people don't understand what heavy actually means. Heavy means somewhere by the fifth-ish, five or sixth rep, like you're shaking. It looks like you're about to go on your first prom date. You are trembling. You are fighting. You are burning. It hurts. It's different neurologically, you could fall right asleep once you put the weights down. Like if you're not training there, you're missing out on a slew of benefits, type two muscle activation, ATP, CP utilization in the metabolic circuit, um, increased neural adaptivity where you actually connect with your body better. But just the same, you get these meathead bros at gold gyms of the universe. Sorry if I just threw a brand under the bus, but you go like, that's where I work out dude, just to get away from where I work. I go to a gold gym and you get these guys that are like, yeah, man, anything over five is cardio, man. So like, I don't do that. And you're just like, well, I see why you look like an egg when you turn sideways. You got a huge chest, but you kind of look like an egg. Um, and so you're missing out on lactic threshold, anaerobic threshold, you know, cardio respiratory benefits. So your high reps should be 15 and above. Your low reps really mean that that last rep, probably rep number five, that's it. That's truly all you could lift. And so the answer is both with an F. Both. Both. Yeah. David, what are your thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so I certainly agree with, uh, with one of the things that Kevin said is, is it starts with a goal, right? And that goal is going to dictate what your heavy kind of looks like. So we have this, obviously, this concept of periodization or essentially program design where you have, you have to take into consideration that client's goal and what they want to achieve, whether it's weight loss or muscle gain or sports performance, or just kind of the, I want to feel better side of things. All of those individuals are going to have significantly different phases or styles of training that they're going to work in. So somebody looking to, to lose body fat might focus more so on the um, kind of higher rep range versus somebody looking to, let's say, gain muscle or even sports performance side of things, 
they may benefit a little bit better in the lower rep range. So it just really is all dependent upon what that person really wants. Um, you know, as Kevin said, there's some pieces that you're, if you're skipping the strength side where you get to, you know, lift something super heavy and you get that, not only all those, those adaptations that he was talking about, but also that like empowerment thing, right. Which I think is really, really important. You feel great after you do a super heavy set of deadlifts or bench press or squat or something like that. It makes people feel good about themselves. And I think that's important. Uh, but you know, again, if, if you work with a lot of weight loss clients, then maybe you stay on the, the lighter, uh, lighter weight stuff, higher repetition, just to make sure you're training the right energy systems and, and stay in the same, the right phase of, uh, of training there. So, yeah. yeah. I like what you said about feeling better. Um, I always look at a lot of research that uh, deals with women and fitness and exercise. And there was a wonderful study done at University of Indiana and they looked at, they compared women that did cardio as opposed to, if not as opposed to, but they compared them to women that did strength training. And you, know, you look at endorphin production, et cetera. How do they feel about themselves? Interestingly enough, the women that did strength training felt better about themselves. Hence the word, they felt stronger about themselves. And it doesn't mean you want to do one or the other. Obviously, we want to do a combination of the two, but integrating the strength training, I'm not sure about doing six reps and shaking violently, but, um, but I still, I think it's incredibly, incredibly important. Um, Abby, and no, I know how you feel about this. Do you? Oh, you do. No, I like both. You know, I'm going to throwback Thursday. I saw and you. Today. I love both. I just, I love both. And I love, and I do like what Kevin said. I wish that I could get some of my classes and my clients. We well, actually I'll tell you what. So you, we all know, we all know Paul Christopher, he does this amazing training. Like every few weeks he'll do a three rep max day, which he picks one exercise and they do a three rep. And we're talking, this is the, the people in the class are 90% women. And they're all doing a three rep max. And we give them all the guidelines. You know, if you can get to five, then you need to increase the load. And you've got seven minutes to do it just, and they do multiple sets, take as much time as you need to in between the sets to recover, to make sure you're, you know, you, if you can lift it more than four times the next set, then you need to go heavier. So I really think there's some um, huge benefits to that. I mean, there's just the benefits of doing strength training. And I don't want to say over cardio, because if you, you know me, I don't love, I, I posted something the other day, I'm like, Tuesday and Wednesday are my most hated days of the week. And then I'm like, oh, those are my cardio days. Ugh. So I'm, I'm teaching classes those days. So I love strength training. And that is where I see, and this is anecdotal, of course, for me, but that's where I see the change in my body. I see the change in my husband's body when he lifts weights versus doing cardio. I know we need both. We'll get, we can talk about the science of that another day, but the strength training, and then even the research about burning fat from doing strength training versus cardio, it shows you actually burn more fat There's from doing strength, strength training versus cardio. Right. And you know, and I, I'm going to say one more thing, but I know there's so many people out there that want to lose weight and they're like, I want to lose weight. I'm going to do the cardio first, lose the weight first. And then I'm going to do the strength training next. Cause I don't want to bulk up. I'm like, I'm like, ah, How so they really, really should be, <laughs> oh my gosh, they should, they, I go crazy. So they should, they should really be doing both a heavy, some light, and then a little bit of cardio in there as well. So yeah, all right, very cool. Geo, thoughts, not, advice. Not to, be, not to be overly redundant. So I'll try to take a different different approach. Is keep in mind that what me what we think is heavy or what we think these people can do and our clients, maybe they're just not physically able to do it. Or you know you have to you have to put it in perspective. For example, you know I have a a couple clients over 80 years old, a 15 pound dumbbell overhead is heavy for them. That is heavy for them. That you may not feel like 15 pounds is so, you know, put things in perspective sometimes. And if someone says that's heavy, don't immediately poo poo it and say, that's not heavy. Come on. That's only 15 pounds. That's only 10 pounds. Maybe, maybe they're lying. Okay. But maybe they're not. <laughs> so right. just, just make sure that, you know, you, 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 you can distinguish the difference or you dig a little bit just to understand that a little bit better. All right, guys, I'm going to show a closing video. I wish we could keep talking. Um, 
Uh, and I'm going to show you guys a closing video. So here we go. As you guys all know, Kevin, I love the photo. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> the world needs more Giovanni Roselli, and I just want to make sure that we we substantiated the professional wrestler claim. All Abby, right. do you have shoes like that? Boots like that? With I do. I've got a couple. I've got two colors. Okay, good. <laughs> I was going to use Abby's photo from the throwback Thursday, clinging onto the fence. I you like that, it. didn't you? I loved it. It was fabulous. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us. Um, Giovanni Roselli, Kevin Mullins, Abby Apple, David Botcher. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys. They're going to be presenting for us at Live Stream Mania. And also be sure to check out Geo Kevin and Abby certification. Don't forget to check out Brooke Bush Institute with, that David's affiliated with. And thank you guys for joining us. Have a wonderful evening.